certainly a lot of viruses that have been linked to evolution. Viruses could be a way to favor the acquisition of different characteristics. Hi, Hi humans. humans! Welcome to Demystifying Science, where we scrape the mud off of confusing phenomena with the coolest Earth thinkers. Today, we met up with Dr. Gary Kobinger a virologist and microbiologist who spent his career working with Ebola and HIV, some of the scariest viruses ever encountered by humans. And like most virologists today, he's also been working towards a vaccine for the present pandemic. Professionally, he is best known for his role in the development of the first Ebola vaccine and ZMAP, a monoclonal antibody treatment against the Ebola virus. In addition to all of this biotechnology, he's also got a pretty extensive teaching resume. That's right. He's a professor at the Universities of Pennsylvania and Manitoba, and at the University of Laval, where he serves as the Director of Infectious Disease Research. Our conversation today covered all kinds of topics upon which Kobinger is uniquely qualified to ruminate. We talk about using gene therapies to treat diseases. How science can leverage biology to cure all kinds of sicknesses. The mysterious origin of viruses on Earth. The possibility of nonprofit approaches to drug development. And the phenomenon of asymptomatic carriers. An hour of time was barely enough to fit all of our topics into one place. We're definitely looking forward to meeting up again once we make our way to Earth. So, in the meantime, humans, feed our bottomless desire for attention and validation by hitting that subscribe button down in the corner of the screen. And offer us a little bite of dopamine by leaving a comment or giving us a like. We'll be back in a week and bring you more human hotshots. Till then, humans. Take care. Bye. infectious viruses. Yes, I do. How did you get started in that? As a kid, I was at one point watching um, a TV show, a documentary about HIV. It was the first uh, few uh, months after HIV had been discovered. And I I heard a, a, a guy saying that he was going to die because he had loved, and I thought that was unacceptable. So I decided to go and uh, develop vaccine against infectious diseases. Wow. And did you study HIV? I did, as a matter of fact, yeah. did my PhD on HIV, uh, gene therapy, um, approaches to HIV. And uh, then did a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in gene therapy, but really uh, focused on vaccine. So what is gene therapy? Gene therapy is the uh, technology that allows to repair uh, genes that are dysfunctional or sick, if you want. And so what you do is you, uh, when somebody has a dysfunctional gene, um, that causes a disease, you can go and repair the gene or replace it. Um, and to do that, you need tools. And often what can be used are viruses that are very good at infect infecting us and bringing genes into our own cells. Wow. So it brings, yeah. So you, it's pretty cool build these, you have to build these medical viruses? Yeah. Yeah, you build them and then you have to test them. But, you know, it's a lot of work because you always hope that they're going to do exactly what you want them to do. But often you find out that they don't. So you need to modify them and modify them and modify them. But it's a fascinating field. When you're designing a virus, do you start with some hints from nature or do you just start from scratch? 
we start with things that we know and that we understand. For example, if you want to replace a gene in the lung, like for a disease that is called cystic fibrosis, you can decide to use a virus that naturally will infect the lungs. So naturally they know how to enter into the cells that are making the lungs where you can repair that, that gene that, is, um, that needs to be repaired. And how do, you, how do you actually repair it once you get into the cells? Because I always thought that viruses weren't modifying human DNA. And that's it. So when you have human DNA that is incorrect, accidentally, for example, and then you bring a healthy gene or healthy sequence of that DNA into the cells, and then a virus has a very interesting capacity to introduce new genes into our own genomes and express, you know, genes make protein and protein have a functions. And in diseases, sometimes that function is lost. So if you can bring in that genetic um, material with a healthy gene that can be producing that healthy protein, then you correct the disease. And so, well, there, perhaps this is a good time to talk about viruses. What exactly is a vi <laughs> what exactly is a virus? I hear people talking about the fact that viruses are alive, but this doesn't sound like something that's alive that's doing this. This is like a this is like a tool. This is like a screwdriver or a hammer that you're using to accomplish something. Yes, but when you want to manipulate and, and bring uh, viruses to your advantage to modify uh, the genetic code, then you use them as tools. But initially, viruses are somehow organisms that depend on us or other cells, mammalian cells, could be animal, uh, could be plant uh, cells, to amplify themselves, so to replicate. And so outside of their organism, they don't replicate. They are inert. They but don't move either, they huh? Can, they don't move. They don't do anything. They cannot grow. They cannot multiply. But then when they enter their own host, their own cells where they can amplify, they amplify themselves and they create more and more and more of them. Now, they can't really enter though, right? It's like they're taken up. Sort of, they're too passive, perhaps. Hmm. Uh, do I understand that correctly? Well, hey, all of this seems like a very passive process. I've seen videos of, you know, like COVID entering lung cells through the, what is it, the ACE2 receptor? And all of it is just protein-based. And it doesn't seem like there's an active decision that's being made on the part of the virus, because, well, the virus can't do anything, right? Well, it can enter cells. That's an active mechanism. It uses a lot of the, the tools from the cells itself, but it does get in and then it replicates. That also is a, an active mechanism that uses energy, as a matter of fact. But and then it produces it the cell's itself. energy or is it the virus's energy? No, it's the cell's energy, mm -hmm. but that's why viruses are so good. They hijack the mechanism of our own cells they use our own tools to make more of themselves. So, okay, what is an exosome? What's the difference between an exosome and a virus? Well, that's a very good question. You know, in many respects, they are very similar. Okay. But in a lot of respects, they are also different. Mm -hmm. Let's start with so how they're exosome. similar, maybe. Okay. Well, they are the same shape. Exosome can be round like a virus and can be made of the same lipidic uh, membrane like a virus. They are budging out of cells like a virus. So that's a lot of common points. They have genes in them also sometimes? Sometimes they can. They can. Sometimes accidentally maybe or, um, uh, you know, I don't know any exosome that has... Well, they can have it on design as well, if because they have function 
as well. Mm. So uh, yeah, the, the, well, for example, exosome can be produced to fuse with other exosome or with endosome that gets in the cell with sample from the outside of the cell and then they could degrade it. Mm. They could make pieces of it. They could, they could re-expose them outside of the cells as signaling ways to communicate. Oh. So protection and talking to other cells in the body? Well, oh, so you, you said something about taking something from the outside and digesting it. And we've been learning a lot about the immune system, about these, I think they're MHC class two molecules. And they're the ones yeah. that are, so are exosomes involved in packaging of external? Or like spreading the message between cells about what needs That's to go. Right. Huh, I never thought That's about right. it that way. Can they yeah. spread at between the same time? Can they transfer between individual organisms? Organism or cells? Well, let's well, start with that is a good question. Yeah, let's start with cells and then we can talk about organisms. Well, usually no, they don't. And this what is one difference uh, with viruses. Viruses can get out of the cells, enter a new cells and replicate, makes more of themselves. Mm -hmm. Exosomes are produced sometimes, but they do not grow to make more of themselves. So they don't contain any instructions for producing more exosomes. That, that's correct. Yes, they don't. So it's a more accidental process. Or is it intentional? Well, sometimes we don't know. Huh. We are still trying to learn. We are still trying to learn what exactly all they can do. Because endosome have better defined function. We understand. We have studied endosome a lot. Exosome. It's not that clear. Sometimes it's very well known. For example, in neurons, you get a lot of exosomes that are releasing neurotransmitter, which are protein that favor transmission of an electric pulse. Mm. And that's, that's making us thinking. But a lot of time, we see a lot of endosome outside of the cells. And quite frankly, I don't think we know everything about and exosome that are produced and that's the beauty of research in science is that you keep digging and you keep understanding and finding new ways and new mechanism and new function that can explain a lot of things in life from how mechanism works to sometimes diseases what causes diseases well so this is really interesting because many people who study viruses seem to fall into two groups. There are those that study the viruses that are dangerous to humans, and then there are those that are going into the environment and trying to identify all the different viruses that live there. They live? Yeah. Or that exist there. And something that seems really interesting is the enormous genetic diversity of viruses in the environment versus the viruses that are actually dangerous to humans. Like there's a lot of viruses, but you think there's not a lot that are dangerous? Well, it seems to be that way, right? That's right. There is uh, over 600 million viruses in nature when actually only above, just above a thousand are linked to diseases in humans. Really? And so imagine the viruses that are causing disease are a very small fraction of the entire number of viruses that are potentially circulating. Not all of them are known. These are calculation, and this is why mathematics is so phenomenal, is that we can calculate viruses that we don't even know about. We don't even know their existence for sure. We have never isolated them. How do you calculate them? Math can tell you if viruses exist? Yeah, it can, because you can go and do calculation from what exists now and what you can detect in nature and get an estimate 
of how many viruses are out there because we usually detect viruses that are causing disease. We don't detect viruses that are not doing anything, that are not causing any disease, that are not creating any phenomenon. We don't know about these. So they are hard to find. Are those sort of accidental failed experiments or do you think that those non say non pathologic viruses do you think that they have some role in nature do they have like an adaptive role mm. that is a good question they could well be they are part of uh, the ecosystem and for a lot longer than human beings have been part of the ecosystem so yeah, it's one of the many hypotheses that could explain what is the role, if any, these unknown viruses may have. Interesting. So they might be trash or they might have some role in transferring genes or mutation for natural selection. Yeah, because we started talking about how you're using these viruses to deliver gene therapies. So that's right. But, yeah. So how many viruses that a human being interacts with are quietly changing the genetic code? Is that something that's happening all the time as you are walking around in the world? Do you think nature is trying to do gene therapy? Is nature gene therapying humans and everyone else? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of viruses that have been looked to uh, linked to evolution, and also evolution of you know, humans are not evolving that quickly. But viruses could be a way to favor evolution, to favor the acquisition of different characteristics. That's, really that's certainly a good that's a Yeah, that's a real hypothesis that many viruses, for example, endogenous wow. retroviruses that we all have, are linked to that evolution. Now, I think with all the viruses out there that we don't know about, there is, in this field of evolution, a lot of things that we don't know about and that we only suspect. And again, this is back to how cool is science and research to understand these new mechan mechanisms and understand these new viruses and identify them and what are they really doing? Yeah, we love human science. Yeah, you humans seem like you're finding out a lot of really interesting things right now, especially with this big virus that's all around the earth right now. Have you been working on this that's right. pandemic virus? Yeah, COVID-19, yes, absolutely. So the virus is called SARS-CoV-2 that causes a disease called COVID. And, and there is probably half of the scientific community right now that is focusing on one aspect or many aspects of this disease right now to try to prevent its spread or diminish the spread or help people that are sick and all the, the different level where you can make things better. So there's something that's really strange about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and not even necessarily strange, but has there ever been a virus that is studied so deeply on Earth before? Yes, I would say HIV, for sure. Um, not all at once, maybe like this, but there is uh, a lot of work that went into HIV and that continues to go into HIV. After 35 years, we still do not have a vaccine against HIV. Not so a single COVID one? Is, uh, I'm sorry? Not a single vaccine against COVID or against HIV? There's nothing? No, oh, there is good candidate. And there is a candidate that I've shown even that were, that were linked to some level of efficacy in human studies. Uh, but they are uh, either very experimental and promising or in the clinic, advanced clinical development were linked to modest protection. So we're talking about less than 35%. So, um, you know, after 35, 35 years, I would call this a lot of work. And, um, you know, every step forward is good, but we still have a lot to, to make. And does that have to do with the fact that the virus is changing 
regularly? Or what are the obstacles? Yeah, absolutely. HIV is such a... Well, HIV is such a big challenge because it changes its face all the time. It's like a, a mutant or a mutating virus or an evolving virus. By the time you make a vaccine, it already made tens of thousands of copies that are escaping that vaccine. So it's very difficult. For this reason, COVID is much easier. COVID is a much more stable virus. Really? It's called a coronavirus that is different completely than HIV that is a retrovirus. And so a lot of these really successful vaccines like measles or polio, is that because those viruses didn't change very much? Actually, a lot of those, yes, it's uh, correct. A lot of those pathogens are not changing a lot compared to HIV. It's mm. always in relation to. You know, influenza, which is another virus that evolves very rapidly, has a vaccine, but the vaccine is often not the best. It's often less than 70% efficacy in protecting people. It's often actually not even working at all some years. And every year we have to adapt it. And this is where the challenge of, of ev evolution of viruses uh, is really exemplified with influenza. And what causes a virus to evolve so quickly compared to one that doesn't? Mm. Well, that's a good question. You know, often it goes with the material, the, the, the genetic information and and composition of a virus. For example, there's viruses that are made of RNA as genetic information. Some viruses are made of DNA. And the, the general rule is that RNA-based viruses evolve more quickly. And the reason is because when they replicate themselves, they make mistake. And those mistake makes many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of copies in a single host. Wow. And so this is, it, this makes it very challenging to develop vaccine again. But isn't SARS-CoV-2 an RNA virus? Yes, it's a very good uh, point. And actually I use this as an example in my classes is that there's always ex the exception that confirms the rule. <laughs> you know, gotcha. SARS-CoV-2 as many coronaviruses is, are very exceptional viruses. They are RNA viruses and they don't evolve very much. They are envelope viruses, so they are made of a, of a lipid membrane hmm. and they are very stable compared to a lot of other viruses that are enveloped. You know, a lipid membrane is what dissolves with soap. This is why we wash our hands with soap and water. So all these pathogen, bacteria, viruses that are composed of, of this lipidic membrane that dis disintegrate. But SARS-CoV-2 and SARS and coronavirus is actually very stable compared to a lot of other envelope viruses. So this makes it, this, this actually is a very interesting uh, virus. So I have a question about viruses in general. If they can only be made by a host and they're very, some of them mutate wildly, some of them are conserved. Where, where did the first virus come from? You know, I would not be able to answer this, but I would love to. I would love to know what Does, came first, the egg or the chicken? You and know what one knows? came first, this, right? Well, but the knowledge is somewhere. And somebody should go and dig it out. So we know where they're coming from. Is it possible that they just assemble randomly in the environment? Could be. One hypothesis as the first cell, the first bacteria, was basically potentially or possibly a random assembly of different molecules that made the the primary structure that could replicate itself. And from there, it grew into more simple microorganism and then more complex microorganism, all the way to cells. Well, it seems like there are really, really, really big viruses on Earth right now that are 
almost like bacteria. Like these huge yeah, that's viruses. Right. So that's right. Could you those viruses? The structure, they're structurally like the structurally. virions are enormous. Yeah, the virions are enormous. They have a very complex genome. The only thing that they're missing is these ribosomes that would actually make them, you know, a real boy, so to speak. Is it possible for them to accidentally right. acquire ribosomes and then become indistinguishable from bacteria? Where do you get a ribosome? Well, you steal one. Uh, that's true. It could be. I look at the eukaryotic cells. They do have mit mitochondria, which are basically bacterial structures. So it's like at one point, a cell needed to have an energy source and decided that why not picking up a bacteria there and working together, the bacteria producing the energy for the cells and the cells contributing food for the bacteria. And here we are with the cells and mitochondria. So yeah, that could be very complex viruses. Arthropox viruses are huge. Mm -hmm. And they could evolve further and, and pick up more uh, functions through organelles or others and then become more independent. Then they don't need cells anymore. Do you think that the early freedom? Yeah. <laughs> could they accidentally like how did how do you end up with a ribosome in the first place? Well, what happens if you just accidentally envelop one when you're being assembled inside of the cell? Like you could probably Can ribosomic structures naturally assemble somehow? Do you know if anyone's done any work on that? Well, what if you take a ribosome that's already uh, you know. fully made? The cell made it. Like, you're inside the cell. Well, that would be easier. Yeah. Oh, that I would thought be good. about before cells. Oh, well, before cells, that's trickier. I'm talking about, so before cells, we don't really know where viruses came from, right? They're just there. No, unfortunately, I would love to know. Okay, and so now I'm thinking about the modern day, where you have these viruses that have become really, really big, and they're getting into cells. And when it's assembled, before it like blebs away from the cell that it replicates inside of, what keeps it from it taking... Picks up a ribosome. Yeah. What, takes it, what, what prevents it from doing that? You know, that's a good question. And, you know, viruses are also very optimal. Hmm. Whether they have five genes, ten genes, or 200 genes... Everything about them is to get to the perfection. The space they occupy, the way they replicate, the number of genes they express, everything is about optimizing. Efficiency. And so, you know, yeah, I don't know that the virus could easily just pick up something as big as, as a ribosome without being quite mm, disturbed by it. And so, you know, not saying it's impossible, but I could see it's difficult. Not that likely. And you know what? It must have happened at one point when you have tens of thousands of viruses that can emerge from one cell. Somehow at one point, maybe there was a ribosome floating by, but whether or not that new virus that that was produced was functional is is really the question. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's all this confusion about bacterial lineages, right? So if you look at evolutionary trees of bacteria, it becomes very cloudy of how they're related to one another sometimes. I agree. And same as for animals, sometimes you don't know. You know, look at sharks. And they're, you know, sharks have the oldest immune system in terms of antibody. Hmm. And it's not clear sometimes, do they come first? Did they come second? What came first? You know, we don't know. Sometimes we have missing pieces of information to put all this together. Again, we're back to the beauty of research. Because those right. structures could sort of evolve independently or something. There's convergent structures or something, right? Maybe. 
What is what's special about the shark immune system? I didn't know it was the oldest one. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not a, a shark biologist, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm I've been studying antibody for a long time, and uh, sharks is a uh, is a very old uh, um, animal, like if you call it an animal or or uh, um, if in the branch of evolution, it's a very old um, species. And so when you look at the production of antibody, um, sharks are one of the first, if not the first, I think, uh, organism that, that started producing antibodies. Hmm. They have been around for, for, for a long, long time, a lot longer than us. And they determine that just because a lot of other organisms share its genes? Is this about shared? Yeah, and you can see. Yeah, you can see when you study uh, genetics and and uh, the code written in, into the genes, uh, you can associate evolution, genetic evolution, uh, to a timeline. And so you can, for example, SARS-CoV-2, you can see exactly when it entered the human population because it changes when it does. And so you can see a pathogen that enters the animal kingdom when because of the adaptation so you can do mathematics also and go back in time and you can find out that the pathogen has emerged maybe 10,000 years ago even if you were not there to document it but you're sort of a, you're sort of assuming like a average mutational rate or something you know when i don't know what that means average oh, i'm because just trying to figure out how you get the rate well, you need to calculate for this one pathogen, and sometimes there is branching so that the pathogen that may have a natural evolution, a natural mutation rate, but sometimes there could be an incidence where it can fuse to another one, or it can jump, and this, for example, if with influenza, you know, there is what we call the drift, so the evolution, the natural evolution of the virus, and then there is the, the jump when a virus, influenza virus can fuse or mix its segment to another influenza virus, and then a new, completely virus can emerge from that. So it's these chimeric viruses, is that what they're called? Uh, yeah, you can call them chimeric. I mean, although I think chimeric sometimes is referred more to if you mix two different viruses as opposed to, um, what I mean is two different completely viruses as opposed to two different influenza, which are the same, uh, eight segment, or segmented uh, particles, uh, but you can have an influenza from a whale, and then you can have an influenza from a whale mixing with an influenza from a pig, mixing with an influenza from a human, and that could produce a virus that has not been uh, um, observed before. It's possible. And so what's interesting about this reconstruction of what happened in the past is that isn't it pretty hard to be certain about how this all came together? Uh, yeah, it is. But the more step, the more study we made, the more, it's like a little bit of a puzzle. And the more we work, the more pieces of the puzzle we get together. And the more we understand and we see a continuity, we see an evolution, we see the step. We understand how these steps occurred and what they caused and the influence they had. Like it seems like it'd be easy to put them in order compared to actually assigning years to the matter. Yeah, I can Sometimes, imagine. Sometimes, yeah, that's a good point. So let's go back to this pandemic that's happening on Earth right now. What has your own role been in attending to the matter as a scientist? And as a vaccine developer, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, we've uh, generated a vaccine. Um, we are using a bit of a different approach than some. We want our vaccine to be free and Whoa. to be available to anybody that wants it. So we are developing that vaccine through what's called a not-for-profit uh, company. So it's a company that does not make money. It just make does work and create good job at the same time, but it does not make money. And so it lowers the cost of generating those vaccines 
and we want those vaccines to be available for free or or for a very cheap uh, amount of money. So we want universal access. And um, what's, that's the one part- what's the timeline on that? Well, we're a bit slower because you understand that, um, you know, it's easier to raise money when people can potentially make more money with their investment. Um, we are going to sources of uh, funding that where people do not make more money because they just accept the concept that the vaccine that will be made will be available for free or at cost, which means there's no money to be made for this. So it takes a bit more time. I think we are, uh, you know, a good two to five years probably from reaching the line, but I think it's not so much the speed that is important as it is to demonstrate that this concept has value. Because even in a year or two, I think we can expect that millions of people, if not dozens and maybe hundreds of millions of people will not have access to a COVID vaccine you, after it has been made available to some. If it takes a few years, are you worried that the virus will change? Change, I don't know, but definitely the human race will adapt to it and the virus will adapt to the human race. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's four coronaviruses that are circulating right now that are causing the common cold, as we call it. Hmm. You know, that's when your nose, your nose is, is, is uh, uh, wet and your sneeze and and all this, but you're not overly super sick. And there's four right now. And when you look at the last two that were introduced in the human population or introduced themselves to the human population, they they actually cause some damages from what we can see from the the partial record of of that time because the last one was in the 1800s. And so, you know, this current virus is the same kind of coronavirus and over time, it will just adapt to the human population. So the point is to minimize damage, to generate a vaccine for soft landing, for protecting the people that are vulnerable, for protecting the healthcare workers that are exposed to potentially higher dose that can lead to more severe diseases. And so this is what we're trying to achieve. But at the end of the day, this virus will adapt, will enter the human population. It is here to stay for a while. This is clear. It's really fascinating that you say that it will enter and adapt to the human population and that it will be around for a while, because that seems to be the case with, say, the Spanish flu as well, right? That's right. It did stay with us for a long time until we had the new influenza that became the new norm which means a new seasonal uh, influenza virus that circulated. I, Do you think the coronavirus can... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, do you think there were influenza viruses before the Spanish flu? Well. Oh, of course. Of course there were. And, and the question is, how many and how much damage did they cause? But, you know, even the Spanish flu in 1918, um, there's not a lot of records when you look at it. Uh, You know, we are still estimating the number of dead, the number of infection. We are still, um, you know, speculating a lot on some observation that were made at the time, whether or not they were linked uh, to uh, influenza 1918. You know, it's, it's often a matter of debate. The one thing we know is this virus did exist did cause a lot of damage we have been able to recreate it actually and to test it and see how aggressive for an influenza virus how aggressive this influenza virus was and or is when when you you recreate it well that was a crazy story the recreation of the influenza virus right somebody had to go and dig up bodies in alaska and find the virus inside somebody's lung tissue right really i think so yeah yeah, and then they sequenced it, and then it was re-cloned into a re- what's called a reverse genetic system. A reverse genetic system is when you re-synthesize the gene, and you mix them together, and then you put them in the cells to, to recreate the virus. And this worked. Actually, it was done where I was working. 
Yeah, by a colleague of mine, the first one. What, what was what was what was his name? It started with a T, K. I don't remember his name. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, Tan Tannenberger, uh, he he actually did the sequencing, but the recreation of the virus uh, to to test in animals, including in non human primates, uh, was done in Winnipeg, Manitoba, wow. by a guy called Darwin Kobasa. This was a study that was led by Yoshi Karaoke. So I remember when I was reading about this, we have a lot of time and space. And so we read a lot of your human research. I remember when I was reading about this, that there wasn't anything that was hugely different about this recreated virus. It was still a little mysterious why it was so deadly, right? Compared to the ones that well, are in circulation I, now? Yeah, I think so. No, no, there was big differences in animals, at least. Hmm. You know, 1918 influenza is much more lethal. Actually, it's the only influenza that has, linked, has been linked to, uh, uh, to lethal infection in non-human primates or in macaques. No other influenza virus has ever been able, uh, to my knowledge, to, uh, to uh, kill a macaque. Uh, instead, 1918 uh, was able at 100% of a uh, fatality rate in at least one experiment. So it's a very aggressive virus. You see it on cells. It replicates very quickly. It causes massive inflammation in the lung, con consolidation in the lung. So it, it can do a lot of damage in a matter of days. We have detected in the early days of 1918, ferrets that were infected where they were shedding, which means they were releasing above one times 10 to the eight. So that's a lot of zero per per ml of uh, of nasal uh, secretion so it was extremely high compared to others it was a hundred to a thousand times more wow but it wasn't it was that very infectious <laughs> amongst families i read which is kind of interesting yeah we've seen all of this interesting data about and honestly about ebola too this idea of asymptomatic carriers where they are exposed to the virus within a single household but not everybody gets sick, right? Yeah, why is that? Yeah, what's going on there? Yeah, and this is the beauty of, uh, of the, and the comp it, it, it's a reflection of the complexity of the human and human genome and the human immune system, the, 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 the defenses that somebody can, can develop following an infection. And you know, the asymptomatic infection in, the, in Ebola disease, um, virus disease are they were underestimated for a long time actually they were not they were more a rumor than a scientific fact mm -hmm. until we saw the tens of thousands of cases in west africa where now it was a lot more obvious although still controversial to what extent you get those uh, asymptomatic infection with ebola and these yeah. oh go ahead nikki I was just going to say, is that because they're able to clear the virus quicker or they just have a less steep immune response? They're less inflamed or is it different depending on the well, virus? Well, you know, for Ebola, one of the major hypotheses, which means one of the ma major explanation is that actually there is other Ebola-like viruses that are circulating that we do not know about, that Whoa. we cannot detect, we have not been detecting. And so these viruses, they cause immunity in people. We know this, we have detected that. And so this immunity is able to fight back against Ebola. And so one hypothesis is that we know there is about 15% roughly uh, of people in Africa where there was never any outbreak of Ebola that have antibody that do cross react, which means they can recognize Ebola. And so these people, when you, they get infected, they're already protected. It's like they, they were vaccinated. And mm. so it explains why some people have a symptomatic infection, because they are like people that were vaccinated, so they are protected. So they don't develop symptoms, but they still can replicate the virus. They still can pass on the infection, like we see with polio, like we see with influenza, like we see with a lot of infectious diseases. What's the rate of being exposed to Ebola and becoming infected? Do you know? I've heard you. I've heard you mention that 
there was authorization of compassionate use for a researcher who pricked herself with an Ebola needle, right? Yeah. And so she was given the vaccine. Well, you know, uh, yeah. So when you when you detect particles of Ebola that are, that are infectious, we can detect particles, let's say we say there is one infectious particle per milliliter, one, one ml, one milliliter of liquid. There's one infectious particle, okay? And let's say you divide that one into 10. So there's less than one infectious particle. And you use that one tenth of a volume and you infect an animal, you will still kill the animal. So it is, it is very difficult to really associate a number of infectious particles that we detect in the lab with in, in on cells versus the number of infectious particles that can kill an animal. And you know, it will be unethical to uh, establish the infectious dose of a liquid in animals because we have to kill them to understand that. But it still so won't affect some never people. never really huh? done. Yeah, so I guess the question is, are there animals that you're using experimentally to look at Ebola that simply don't get infected? Like if you give an animal an injection of Ebola, is there ever a case where an animal doesn't actually develop Ebola? Yeah, we, yeah this was reported and uh, it's possible. Uh, it depends actually of the route of infection. Hmm. So in... In an infection where we inject the virus in the muscle, this has not been shown. But if you give the, the virus um, through other route, for example, mucosal exposure, then you can have that. You can have an infection that does not kill the animal. Has anyone looked to see it? So, and you know... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, and you know, it's, it, it, it's um, I think, a reflection of the complexity that we do not always understand of viruses. We see one thing, which is a virus kills somebody, but we do not see the virus that do not kill people or do not make them sick often. With COVID now, we see it more because we see a lot of people that do not have symptoms, that they say, I'm well, I don't have any symptoms, I don't have a headache, I'm not tired, I'm totally fine. But the test can detect the virus, and these people can be linked to an infection, so it means they can transmit, they can infect somebody else, but they have no symptoms. And that somebody else they infect can get symptoms and could actually die. So it's, uh, it's these phenomenon that we don't always see because they don't at attract our attention. What attract our attention is people that are sick, people that die. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So those mice that can only be mucosally, uh, I guess through mucus, they can't be infected. So sometimes they will fail to be infected. Do those mice just not get the virus in their body? Do they still develop antibodies or are they just the virus is failing to make entry into their cells? Yeah. So like if you treat a mouse mucosally and it doesn't develop Ebola and then later you give it an intramuscular injection. Will it get Ebola? Will it have the antibodies still? Right. So I, I will talk more about macaques because the experiment were, were more uh, uh, documented in macaques. And, and the answer is yes. So if you give the virus mucosally, um, for example, in the nose, you can have, or I'll, I'll, for example, a spray. If you spray the virus in the face of a macaque, the macaque will develop antibodies, but will not develop disease. Wow. At least in one setting when this was tested. So, but if you give the virus inside the lung, then usually all of them will get the disease and will die. Mm. So it depends really how you expose them. Do you think that's because the virus just is more pathological to lung tissue? When it infects a lung cell, it's just more likely well, to do damage? Yeah, so, so what we know is the envelope of Ebola can mediate attachment of the virus to airway epithelial cells that are in the lower airway. We know uh, this. This has been done. But not the upper. Well, it's not very, what's not very clear that has never been really shown, presumably because it doesn't work very well, is that these, these interactions between Ebola and cells in the upper airway are not very efficient. So what it means is that the virus does not infect very well the 
airway cells that are in the nose, for example. But it, and so the body still explain. can process these antigens somehow. That's right. Or maybe it's at the, such a lower dose uh, that the, vir the, 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 the body can fight back and then develop antibodies and not, you know, not succumb or not, not suffer from the infection. It's not clear, actually. This has never been uh, well-defined. Hmm. So, like, maybe the vir virions get chewed up by some sort of enzymes in the saliva or mucus, and then they're processed in a way that allows the antibodies to be developed without actually being pathological. Something like that. That's right. Yeah. And how does your vaccine against Ebola work? This was quite, this was, you, yours was the first vaccine that was developed, correct? Uh, develop uh, the first, I don't know, but the first one that was licensed, yes. So that is available for, um, for um, uh, you know, uh, vaccination at the population level. So a country can, can acquire doses now. Um, so it, it was licensed by the regulatory agencies in Europe and the, the, the one in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, it was the first and still today is the only, only one that is licensed or that is available. Um, so the, 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 that vaccine is actually quite interesting because um, it came from a, the modification we talked at the beginning of modifying viruses for gene therapy. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's modifying a virus that is actually an animal virus that is called vesicular stomatitis virus that caused a very mild disease in animals and that has never been linked to disease in humans, although humans can be infected by this virus because we can detect traces of it, like antibodies. And so this virus, animal virus, was modified in the 90s, late 90s, was published in 1997 by Yoshi Karaoka as a tool to study entry mediated by the glycoprotein of Ebola. So what the, he did is he took the, this animal virus and it disguised it. He got the outer shelf to be exactly the same as Ebola, but the inside was the animal virus. So like a chimeric virus. Mm. And, and this, to study entry, was turned into a vaccine later on by Heinz Feldman, who was coming from a German lab that had uh, dis discussed this idea. And so the, the, the idea was to use this animal virus coated with the Ebola outer shell glycoprotein and then try to see if this could show the immune response an image of Ebola without being Ebola. Mm. And then the immune response can develop defenses. And then when they see the real Ebola, the defenses are there and then they fight back and they can prevent the infection from killing the host. And this is how the vaccine works. So the vaccine is really an animal virus that was turned into a weapon against Ebola. Hmm. It's like a reverse Trojan horse. Yeah, I like that. It is. <laughs> yeah. So, and this was all done in biosafety level four conditions, or is the virus just not dangerous and so it can be worked in normal conditions with? No, the vaccine itself can be worked in normal condition. Although even at the beginning, it was in higher biocontainment. Actually, it started in level three. So there's four level, one, two, three, four. And then it was downgraded to two. Uh, but because it's an animal pathogen, it can infect animal, it, it remains too. Uh, the virus Ebola is a level four, is the highest level. And the reason is because it kills a high percentage of people infected. And also, uh, there's no treatment, or there was no treatment at the time. Now there is. So actually, in theory, right now, that we have uh, a few, actually, uh, 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 treatment against Ebola and a good vaccine, and probably more than one, actually, but one licensed one. Um, this virus should not be a level four anymore. It what, should be downgraded, but that has not been done yet. What are the treatment strategies that have been developed? Are they antiviral or are they working on the immune system's reaction? That's right. So there's a, a, a couple of antivirals that were tested that seem to may, maybe have an impact. But the really the one that are the most promising and that were approved recently was uh, uh, based on monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibody produced in natural defense system like we have, 
and then you can go and isolate those antibody and produce them. You take the best one, and then you produce them in test tube, and then that's your treatment. You can administer that to somebody that is sick. And it sort of tags the virus for removal, or it gets the immune response going properly? A little bit of everything, yeah. It's not actually uh, fully understood. There is, you know, a lot of mechanisms that are behind uh, that treatment. You know, antibody can have nine functions. And, you know, how many of those nine functions are involved? What are the proportion of those functions? It's still, first, it's, it's a matter of which antibody you're using, but it's still not fully defined for uh, any of those treatments. But what we know is that if you get somebody that is sick and you administer those monoclonal antibodies, so those antibodies that are produced outside of the body, so in test tube, you can save not only uh, animals, but you can also save humans. So it's, um, you know, it could be the second era of antibiotics, uh, which actually was uh, told uh, to me in, in 2012 and 2014 when we published the first uh, study in macaque, a journalist actually told me, this could be the, the a new era of antibiotics. I thought it was pretty optimistic, but you know, I think he was right now because you see the number of, of projects developing monoclonal antibodies as a treatment, which did not happen before, that did not really exist before. There was RSV, but mm. RSV is a prophylaxis, which means you give the antibody to not get the disease, mm. not to get treated from the disease. So it's a distinction. Although the idea has been around for a long time, you know, from the 70s, 80s, as a matter of fact. Is anybody having any success with the present pandemic using monoclonals? Oh, I'm sure you will see some interesting data coming out very soon. Ooh. There's a lot of ongoing studies. And what's interesting is that we're talking about a respiratory pathogen. When you give that monoclonal antibody, either intravenous or intramuscularly, so it's... Um, you know, you're not giving it in the lungs, what you would think would be uh, best, and maybe it is best, but for now, this has not been tried or is not, um, you know, uh, fully optimized. But it's great to see that um, a respiratory pathogen that infects the lung may be controlled uh, and, and you could treat a lung disease with an antibody that you inject in, in the bloodstream. Is and that I think we're gonna see some very, very good data soon. Is that just because there's no way to deliver antibodies in an aerosol right now? That's the difficulty? Uh, you know, in principle, it's simple physics and it's simple mechanic, basically. Uh, but to really deliver the, the right dose and to have this antibody going to the right place, uh, you know, I think this is not very well controlled right now is, is really the, the reason. Uh, instead, when you inject in the bloodstream, you know exactly what you're injecting and you know the amount, and you know that it's anyway going all over your body, including in the lung. Mm. So, um, but um, you are fantastic. I mean, I cannot get tired of looking at the two of you. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> thank it's you. awesome. Thank and you. you have, you, have, uh, you, have uh, you know, you have touched so many basic virology question. You brought me back years, and, and uh, you know, there was a phenomenal, I think this would be a, if ever, I don't know what you're going to do with this recording, but I think there's a lot of good stuff for uh, younger and not even younger individual, even uh, university level, uh, because there is a lot of great uh, general principle of virology, evolution, bacteriology, parasitology. Um, anyway, phenomenal. I would say this is your making because it's uh, it's easy for me. I just answer a question. For you, you have to lead and keep the story going, and that's that's what's great. Well, we love this topic. We've spent a lot of time looking at it, so we'd yeah. love to talk to you more in the future. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, we can set another time. That, I'll be happy. Awesome. Well, have fun with your family, and thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Talk to you soon. Another time. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.